What was the original conception of the special military operation in terms of its goals and the net assessment that allowed Putin to initiate it? Yeah, I think uh, President Putin decided that all of his efforts to talk us into some level of understanding mm -hmm. had failed. And having failed to persuade us that Russia would not tolerate NATO membership for Ukraine and would not tolerate the eventual positioning of NATO forces, especially NATO missiles, long-range strike weapons in eastern Ukraine, uh, led him to conclude he had to go in and demonstrate how, just how serious he was. I think he made a number of ass assumptions about how this would work out, turned out to be invalid. One of his assumptions was that the United States in particular, the leadership in Washington, as well as the leadership in uh, Kiev, would want to negotiate that they would, they would want to avoid right. a wider war. I don't think he was prepared for what turned out to be the opposite. So the, the first going in proposition was, we're going in with limited numbers of troops. We're going a short distance into Eastern Ukraine, principally into those areas where the majority of the population speaks Russian. And uh, we plan to demonstrate that we are serious and we want to negotiate. And he outlines certain things that he wanted, number one, Obviously, Ukraine had to be neutral, not a member of NATO, neutrality. Right. Didn't go into great detail about what that neutrality would mean, but probably something close to uh, Austria or Finland. Secondly, he, he thought, well, there are two provinces that are, or oblasts, whatever you want to call them, that are breakaway, Donetsk and Luhansk, and they should have the right to live as Russians inside Ukraine, have equal rights yeah. as Russians, as Ukrainian citizens enjoy some measure of autonomy. And then, of course, there's the issue of Korea, or excuse me, Crimea. Please recognize the legitimacy of Russian control of Crimea, which, from the standpoint of the Russians, having conquered it in the 1770s, uh, is a self-evident truth. Now, in addition to that, he also talked about eventually having a Russian representative sit on the equivalent of the Ukrainian National Security Council simply as a representative of Russian interests to that Security Council. That's about it. So he would have been not happy, but satisfied with that as an outcome. Yes. And uh, I think he was quite surprised that there was no real willingness to seriously consider it. Now, we do have evidence towards the end of March, after yeah. the war had been going on for six weeks, that uh, Mr. Zelensky said, well, we could live with neutrality. And when that right. word seems to have reached Washington and right. London, uh, Boris Johnson, people became incensed, and trip. Boris yeah. Johnson represented Washington's interests and said, absolutely not. We will support you to the bitter end. You must stand your ground and fight for every inch of Ukraine. Well, apropos of this, why did uh, uh, Mr. Putin believe that this would work? Um, the U.S. had been uh, training up, uh, essentially, a uh, ersatz NATO force, the second strongest army in in yes. Europe after Russia, uh, up to NATO standards, and had spent billions yes. on this yeah. enterprise. Now, why would Putin not take that into account? I think there are several reasons. First of all, Vladimir Putin, unlike his predecessors, really does know something about the West. If we go back through many Soviet and Russian leaders over centuries, very few had actually traveled outside of their homeland. That's not the case with Vladimir Putin. And he is predisposed to cooperate with the West, right. not just on a business level, but also on a cultural sense. His record shows that. So that was part of it. Secondly, uh, he did not want to convey the impression that there was anything Soviet-like about the current uh. state. And so he was not going to send forces into Ukraine that would be destructive. You mean like Hungary in 56? Of course. And he gave strict orders to the forces that went in there, I don't want you to kill civilians. I want you to minimize losses in the civilian population, try not to destroy infrastructure. And I think his assumption was that we would somehow or another figure out what his intentions were. We were never really interested in his intentions. In fact, from our vantage point, I think we thought this war was mana from heaven. Yeah, that this was yeah. a war that this new Ukrainian army that we'd invested so heavily in could win. And we mistook you know, the underlying assumptions that shaped the initial operation as evidence for weakness. What point did the uh, Russians and Mr. Putin realize that the Ukrainians being persuaded to fight what amounts to, from their perspective, total war, uh, 
did uh, Russia decide to recalibrate? You know, that's, that's a question that's tough to answer without yeah. seeing the uh, actual transcripts <laughs> of the meetings that were conducted. But we know that in April and May, there were several meetings and several discussions because the feedback that was coming from Ukraine, from the Russians living in Ukraine, was very interesting. Because the Russian troops told them, well, we're here to liberate you, but we're not staying. And so the Russian-speaking population said, well, if you're not going to stay, as soon as you leave, if we cooperate with you, the Ukrainian secret police that we call the SBU will come here, shoot all of us in the head. And this happened. Yeah. So if you're not going to stay, literally, the hell with you. We're not going to support it. This became increasingly obvious as, as the war drew on. And that was the, the first thing. The second thing was we sent very hostile signals. You, you go back to March and listen to President uh, Biden's speech, which was the famous regime change speech right. by accident, <clears throat> that until Putin is removed and this state is transformed into something that meets our standards, right. there can be no peace. And I, I think it took a while for that to sink in. And, and suddenly, uh, by the beginning of the summer, it was very clear that what they had done would not secure Russia. Manned it with uh, an, a relatively small force, a kind of economy of force operation. Yes, they never had more than 20% of their ground force engaged. Right. And uh, that's a, that is a very small contingent, about 190,000 troops initially. <clears throat> and then it became clear that that was going to be inadequate because the war was not going to end with the capture of these territories. Right. So there, at some point in the summer, there was a meeting between the general staff, the Stavka, and I, I think uh, President Putin. And his question was, well, what do we have to do to win this war and right. end it? Because the key, key issue is not just we want to win on the battlefield. We want to win in such a way as we bring this war to a close. Well, people were always shown these marvelous uh, films of right. Russian tanks being destroyed by various things, javelin missiles, and, and of course the, the one weapon system the British are using, this light anti-tank weapon system, mm -hmm. which is really very, very good. It's, it's turned out to be much more effective than the, based javelin, yeah. than the javelin, based on the reports coming in. And uh, the Russians looked at all of this and said, uh, well, Mr. President, if you want us to win this and bring this to a close, we have to make fundamental change in all of the assumptions. Right. And first and foremost, we have to move over to the strategic defensive. And this is going to have to be, for the time being, an economy of force operation because we don't have enough forces. Not only are you going to have to bring in most of the regular army, right. the active force, we're going to need additional reservists and volunteers. What's really interesting on the Russian side is the enormous success yeah. which they've had with volunteers, not just Chechnya, but also within Russia itself. So this, this changed the character, but then the decision was, well, if we're going to hold this territory, and this is when Sorovikin is named the new commander, he said, I'm happy to hold this territory, but I don't want to be committed to holding every inch of this. If I, if I feel it's necessary to withdraw somewhere, to economize so that yes. I could be more successful elsewhere, I want to be able to do that. And President Putin said, you are now the theater commander. You are in command. Everyone takes orders from you. So there was a restructuring of the commands to ensure that he was now the final say on any operational item that occurred in the theater. That was not the case earlier. And it seems to me that what you're suggesting is that uh, Sorovikin sort of deliberately did this in both the, the part of the Kharkiv Oblast and also yes. in Kherson Oblast. Yeah, well, the, the, the Russians have an advantage, though, over us in this sense. They understand that ground in and of itself has no real value unless it confers a military advantage on you. There's no point in just holding onto ground for the sake of saying, well, here on the map I've drawn a line and I'll go no further, which of course was the Hitlerian mistake yes, that yes, lost yes. the war in the East, or one of them. And the, the bottom line is he said, look, we're not going to defend something that we can easily retake when we decide it's necessary. We're going to stay where we think we can defend effectively. And so for weeks I was being asked by people, well, the, the Russians withdrew 10 kilometers here, they withdrew 20 here, and so aren't they in retreat? Is this not evidence for Russian uh, decay and a crumbling defense? Uh, never. It never was. But all of these things were approved by Sorovikin. He made it very clear that local commanders had authority to do what made sense, but he was still in command and these decisions had to be 
checked with him. Well, before we leave this second phase, I think yeah. it's useful to point out that Sorovikin is in a position not very different from Montgomery during World War II. Americans usually scorn Field Marshal Montgomery based True. on this ridiculous Patton movie, <laughs> which, which was unfair to Montgomery by, you know, Montgomery's actually a very competent officer, but Montgomery was very sensitive to minimizing his casualties. And when Sorovikin took over, he made it very clear he would not countenance any frontal assaults. He was not going to waste lives unnecessarily. And I think he got the same level of trust and confidence from Putin that Montgomery got from Churchill. You can do whatever you want. I will give you all the material necessary and we will do what you say and we will attack when you're ready. And I think Sorovikin is the sort of man that said, I'm not making a move until all of the conditions are met that I think are essential to guarantee successful offensive operations. So the third phase quite clearly has been one of mobilization, building up forces, mm -hmm. uh, uh, levying attrition on Ukrainian forces to, to weaken them, mm -hmm. perhaps fatally. Mm -hmm. And then um, there's also preparation of the battlefield for the offensive. Could you just go through those? Uh, well, I think if you talk about in intelligence preparation of the battlefield, mm -hmm. the Russians are not going to make the mistake that they made before they went into eastern Ukraine. In other words, they're not going to assume that they're going to enjoy support uh, without commitments that they're prepared to make to the population. They also understand that uh, infrastructure is important, but not all infrastructure. And they also want to make absolutely certain that they are going to annihilate most of what passes for air defense before they begin this offensive. And that's also, by the way, very reminiscent of the Allies during World War II that went to great lengths to strip away as much as possible the German Air Force. And then finally, I think the buildup of supplies and ammunition, the pre-positioning of medical support, all of those things have been happening and Sorovikin has been personally involved in it. He and Putin, by the way, have actually gone down to the troop level to look at how these reservists are being equipped. Do they have the right winter clothing? Do they have the right set of equipment? Do they have the adequate training? This has been a very thorough process. And what he wants to know at some point is, first of all, is the transportation infrastructure now at a standstill? Have we attacked all the fuel and ammunition storage points? Uh, have we eliminated the power grid for all intents and purposes, forcing people to flee because, frankly, from their vantage point, the fewer civilians they have to deal with, the better. Oh, yeah. By the way, to their credit, and they never get credit for this, they always bring food and medicine with them when they move into these areas and distribute it. And no one carries this in the West right. because we're right. busy maintaining this narrative of the evil Russians. All of these things are being carefully examined. And when he's satisfied that in each of these categories, I'm sure he probably has a chart somewhere. You know, we sometimes did it in the, in the Pentagon as red, gro red, green, or yellow. Yeah, I know. Uh, he may have something similar to that. Has this condition been met? When all of those are met, and of course we're talking about weather, which is no small consideration in that part of the world. And I know that they have been waiting for things to freeze and they just haven't gotten there yet in the Deep South. Now, you, you had said at one point to me that it, it, it would take two weeks yes. uh, at the end of the Rasputitsa for the ground to thoroughly freeze, so you said to a level of right. three or four feet. But now, having said that, we have to go back and re-examine re this economy of force mission, which has turned into something much more than an economy yeah, yeah, of force yeah. mission. They discovered that they could actually induce the Ukrainians to launch counterattacks against them. And this is the, the issue that we don't really appreciate in the, in the ground force. We don't appreciate this coupling of ISR, intelligence surveillance reconnaissance, with strike weaponry. Not just artillery in the conventional sense, but yes. everything that falls into the standoff attack uh, category. And the Russians have a lot of experience with this. Certainly in World War II, there's this famous event when they had surrounded 50,000 German troops outside of Minsk, which I cover in the book, Zhukov, as an army, command, army front commander, was able to say, I want every air, air, aircraft available, immediately scrambled to attack the Germans in this encirclement. Within minutes, thousands yeah. of Soviet aircraft, bombers, fighter bombers, began arriving and pulverizing this, the Germans. And by this time in the war, they were surrounded by armor tanks and artillery so the Germans couldn't get out, which historically they've been able to escape. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you fast forward to the present, there are examples of 
cruise missiles being launched within minutes from the Black Sea, from vessels down there, to strike targets yeah. in Ukraine as far north as Kharkov, where there were Ukrainian artillery and anti-tank positions that could not be reached by any other means. And it was done within minutes. There was no lengthy debate with the Air Force. There was no lengthy targeting discussion. It was done. So in effect, the Western media is handing the Russians the benefit, a, a big surprise moment, by being unwilling to talk about what's actually happening. Well, I think you could say those things. I'm not sure that we could attribute it to Moskarovka. This is a self-inflicted wound. But the key thing here, and this is something we discussed earlier today uh, with Roger, and that was we are it, see two opponents, one Russian, one Ukrainian, sitting on either side of a chessboard. Each side can largely see what the other has. Right. This is something we haven't really confronted in the past. There's not much happening on the Russian side that we cannot monitor with space-based surveillance and uh, all the technologies at right, the National right. Security Agency and all of these, this information is then fed to the Ukrainians on a routine basis. And we have lots of thousands of contractors, former soldiers and, pro and undoubtedly NATO staffs at lower levels taking advantage of this. But what the Russians did not expect, and this has worked to their advantage, is that they would be foolish enough to launch attack after attack after attack for political reasons to try and demonstrate that there was life left in mm -hmm. the Ukrainian mm -hmm. armed forces. Well, that's and, sort of a projection. And Yeah, and if you look at Bakhmut right now, this is the topic in the press right now. Bakhmut is being portrayed as a strategically vital logistical hub, rail, rail, everything. And if it is lost, that conceivably that could unhinge the strategic or operational right. defense in southern Ukraine. I don't know if that's all true. But what we do know is that the Russians have simply held the cheese out for the mice and said, please come in and defend Bakhmut. So they've held back from actually capturing it in the hopes that more troops would be introduced. They just introduced another 20,000 into Bakhmut a few days ago, half of whom are not Ukrainians. Thousands of Poles, Americans, yeah. British, well, so I've, forth. I've heard that the Poles have suffered 5,000 casualties. Uh, I know that uh, there, these are unofficial reports coming right. to me from people on the ground in Poland that have relatives in Poland and in Ukraine, and they say as many as a thousand Polish soldiers may have died. Well, that would that would jive with five thousand casualties. But this is this, of course, is a gift to the Russians. And what's happened now with the economy of force is that the morale down there has gr has risen dramatically right. because soldiers are always much happier when they see damage inflicted on the enemy. So instead of simply sitting there and waiting for someone to attack, they've managed to manipulate the battlefield. And with this ISR strike capability, do enormous, enormous damage. If, as I think we're both confident, uh, Mr. Putin does want to have a fourth phase that terminates the war smartly, if not decisively, then what, what would actually achieve that? <clears throat> well, I think it's important to go back and remember that there was never any intention whatsoever right. to conquer all of Ukraine. Remember, right. this place is the size of Texas. And to be perfectly frank, the Russians really don't want to have to manage millions of Western Ukrainians who have absolutely no desire to live under Russian rule or government. They never did. In fact, Putin, in a speech given back in 2015 or 16, uh, it was sort of a statement he made during a question and answer period. I think it was in St. Petersburg. Somebody asked him, well, what about the Western Ukrainians and what do you think they want? So he said, well, let's be frank. They'd probably be happier under Polish administration than they would be under our administration. Right. Didn't bother him in the least. Uh, I think what he wants is a clear, unambiguous outcome. Ukrainian armed forces are gone. Right. They're devastated, unambiguously defeated. This government in Kiev is, is gone. Right. It's vanishing. Either it is moved to Poland or it is being destroyed. And that's, that's the first condition. Then the next thing is, well, we're going to redraw this map. Now, I think he would prefer to negotiate over some of that. He would like to have a partner, a strategic right. partner. But if he has to with, redraw it, I think he's likely to simply say the Dnieper River is now the, the western boundary of Russia. Uh, I think yeah. that's his inclination. And I think at the moment it's the inclination because his, his fear is...
Well, let's assume we just take the southern areas, the areas that are traditionally Russian, down to Odessa from Kharkov and call it a day. It's a long front. It's very vulnerable. It's, it's vulnerable. It's a long front. And who's to say a future government is not going to try and move over that Dnieper River, build up a force on the western side or on the eastern side, and resume the yeah, stupid absolutely. hostile operations? That would be a classic standard revanchism. Yeah. And if he takes our threats seriously, that we're going to try and turn Ukraine into some form right. of Afghanistan. Right. He wants a clear boundary that he can easily defend and monitor what's going on on the other side. Mm -hmm. But what would be an effective operation that would not outrun itself, that would not, uh, in the fa famous Clausewitzian not universe, itself. Yeah, yeah, it would not reach the culminating point of attack before achieving its objective. Mm -hmm. So what would that look like? Well, there are three very large concentrations of Russian forces. You have the one in southern Ukraine, and this is beyond the troops that were there several right. months ago. Right. And then another concentration east of Kharkov. If you just go due east from Kharkov Belgoro. into western Russia, yes. Yeah, okay. In that area, you have another concentration. And then you have a concentration now in white Russia or Belarusia. And that concentration is probably... Uh, south of Minsk and between Minsk and maybe just north of uh, the Ukrainian border west of uh, Kiev. That's where the major concentrations are. 75,000 Belarusian troops and the Belarusians have made it clear that they are with the Russians and the Russians are with them uh, but most of them are now committed to the border with Poland and Lithuania. Uh, there was a sudden uh, surprise announcement that the Belarusian forces will be under Russian command. Mm -hmm. Is that being done uh, simply uh, as a, a, a way to preserve unity of command if, it, if those forces are actually launched on an offensive? Or is it a way to ensure that uh, nervous Ukrainians who are very worried about Kiev will keep a large percentage of their forces tied up against the Belarusian border? Well, I think both of those are true. Uh, the second one uh, is, is a more difficult proposition because they're down to about 190,000 effectives left in the, whole Ukrainian, in the Ukrainian army. army. And how big are the numbers that could be unleashed in a, a Russian offensive? Well, they've got uh, over half a million uh, concentrated in those three areas, and that, those numbers continue to grow. And that doesn't include the Belarusian army. Right, doesn't include the Belarusians. Uh, and I think the other part of the issue is Belarusia wants the Western allies in Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Poland to understand that an attack on them will be treated as an attack on Russia. Right. That, so disabuse yeah. them of some notion that they can intervene against Minsk. So there's powerful symbolism to have yeah. this unity. But uh, they've also said that if the Russians strike south into northern Ukraine, that Belarusia will support that with troops. Is it really necessary to launch a strike south from Belarusia? And what would that hope to achieve what would be the objectives? Well, you know, this is an interesting question because they have the potential for two or three operational axes. And one of the goals of this new offensive will be to permanently cut off Western Poland from Ukraine. Uh, In other words, uh, to ensure yeah. the Ukrainians are not being supplied any longer with Western mem right. uh, weapons over that border. And if you look at the concentration of force that's up there, you know, in broad numbers, we've counted uh, 1,500 tanks, 1,000 rocket artillery systems, this isn't all three drone systems. Uh, yeah, this is all three. Uh, thousands of armored fighting vehicles, thousands of conventional artillery. Yeah. Uh, how these are going to be distributed is going to, is, I'm not priv privileged to that, I don't know, but I see a substantial enough concentration in Belarusia that it makes sense to strike downwards, which would be west of Kiev, yes. but east of the Polish border. And if yeah. you look at the map, you can go from uh, Belarusia down to Zhidomir, from Zhitomir to Vinitsa, and it's a short stint then to Moldova. That's and see, right. Moldova is important because we've eyed Moldova repeatedly I as know. a potential jump off point for operations against the Russians in southern Ukraine. But, you know, the bottom line, if you look at that, that's, that's a, a fairly straightforward, you, just by positioning the force there, now Kiev is isolated. Well, it's somewhat ironic, but several times on Polish television, uh, in news programs, they put up maps of a post-war settlement in which the, the little bit of 
Ukraine Western is Hungarian, Ukraine. Yeah. would go back to Hungary, the little bit that's Romanian, would go back to Romania. And then there are three oblasts, yeah. which were once part of Poland until not so very long ago. Yeah. And so in a way, you might have a kind of a complicity mm -hmm. uh, between Poland and, and Russia. And what would be left then between the area, the oblast around Lviv, would be a rump state of Ukraine serving as a buffer, and then Russia proper. Well, see, the nice thing about going to Zhidomir and then down to Venitsa is that you are not confronting a Polish military contingent. And if we are stupid enough to commit 30 or 40,000 U.S. troops 50 or 60 kilometers into western Ukraine, if they sort of take that line, then they could conceivably avoid confronting us. Uh, I, you know, I'm hopeful that we will not do that because I, I, I would think that someone would not want to bankroll or back up Polish annexation of territory or anybody else's annexations. I mean, it's beginning to sound like Czechoslovakia in 1938. Indeed, indeed. Well, it is on people's mind, though. Oh, of and, course. And, and so what, to me, what these little ironical admissions uh, suggest or signal is that in spite of all the, uh, the rhetoric, the political rhetoric that is pushed mm -hmm. out there, that elites are, are thinking seriously about a post-war settlement that does not involve the um, status quo ante for Ukraine, to say the least. Well, I think it also creates the possibility that whatever settlement emerges will not include Washington. And to be frank, Washington would be smart to stay out of it. Whether or not we're smart enough to do that, I don't know. But anything that can occur without us and it offers stability in some form is probably desirable. And I'm sure from the Russian vantage point, they would be less concerned about the Polish presence provided it did not symbolize a, an aggressive NATO presence. A stalking horse for the U.S. Yes, in other words. and no U.S. missiles and right. so forth and so on. Now, th that, of course, is a huge assumption given the Polish attitudes, which are frankly dangerous. The assumption is that uh, Russians cannot break through uh, the intense fortifications that the U.S. and NATO helped the Ukrainians construct over eight years. And they're, they're fairly uh, extensive. They look like the height mm -hmm. of a, a trench development, pillbox, et cetera, development in, in, in World War I. But the assumption is that the Russians are taking horrendous losses trying to take them. And the issue, it seems to me, is that Americans don't seem to understand that fortifications can delay an offensive, but they can't stop an offensive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is something that came up early on. I think we have a very light infantry-centric leadership yeah. in NATO uh, because of the last 20 years mm -hmm. of light infantry operations against very weak insurgents. The British fall into this category naturally given their imperial past. The French also, although the French to their credit I think have largely stayed out of this, right. at least in physical terms on the ground. I think the, the idea of a fortification is appealing because there's an assumption that if you place forces inside a city, everyone has to stop to remove them. Right. But in reality, the opposite is the case. If you are kind enough to immobilize yourself, uh, the enemy is probably going to respect your decision to immobilize yourself and will <laughs> e you know, eagerly surround yeah. you, cut off your water, cut off your food, right. whatever sustenance, you will run out of ammunition, and then you have a choice. You can either surrender or be annihilated while the bo main body of the force moves on to other locations. This was the sort of Hitlerian approach in World right, War II. Right. Let's have fortified places and the Soviet armies will have to stop. No, Soviet armies didn't stop. That shows at the end of the war in Kurland, for example. <coughs> sure. You had a whole German army just uselessly bo uh, boxed in. Yeah. So I, I think this is, a, this is a huge problem for us because it undermines all our assumptions about yeah. how we want to fight in the future. The second thing is, you know, we, we've found, we think we found a new technology that will destroy tanks. Well, the, the, you've got lots of technologies that have always had them to destroy tanks. Oh, totally. It's like minefields. We've always had minefields, millions of mines all over Eastern Europe during World War II, North Africa. It's not a new phenomenon. Tank begat anti-tank almost yeah, immediately. Yeah, of course. So. But what people learn to do is to partner these capabilities with other capabilities that are designed to protect them or enhance them. And so you, you may see a change in the balance. Instead of 100 tanks, there may only be 50 in the future and more of something else. Right. But the bottom line is that you end up with a different construct. Yeah. 
that's designed to exploit that strike capability thanks to ISR. So instead of sitting and waiting for something to happen, you are now moving through the ISR stri strike environment. Well, this is what has struck me so much about the war in Donbass, where you have this World War I-like uh, buildup of fortification and how essentially passive the Ukrainians mm -hmm. have been. Or if they're not passive, they're like little attacks in World War I. They're suicidal. Well, they started with very large-scale counteroffensives, 50, 60,000 troops. They've been cut down to company size elements, right. relentlessly being hurled against these defenses, which again, as we pointed out, is the Russians have welcomed this, but it has been detrimental to, to the Ukrainian war effort. Well, the corollary to talking about fortification thus is to talk about fires. Mm -hmm. And Americans have a completely cartoon-like understanding mm -hmm. uh, from the Soviet days, but also just in their head that somehow Russian fires are massive but indiscriminate and because they can't be precisely or promptly targeted uh, are not achieving their goals. And I just would like you to clear up the, the Russian uh, approach to and um, success with fires in this war. The, the first thing we have to understand <clears throat> is the monopoly on the micro circuitry mm. that was essential to precision that we enjoyed in 1991 is gone. Right. As soon after the turn of the century, that microcircuitry found its way into Russia and China and elsewhere. The Russians, the Chinese, and, and anybody that cares to buy their equipment, obviously, now has the ability to attack precisely any point that they can identify, provided they have the range with a weapon system. So the, the Russians now have the ability to deliver accurate, devastating firepower with enormous precision to the point that immobilizing yourself or sitting still for any great length of time is very dangerous. Now, if you can disappear under 20 feet of concrete or something temporarily, you, you may survive for a while, but it's not a long-term solution. The only long-term solution is some degree of protected mobility, integrated air defenses, and the Russians have demonstrated that their integrated air defenses have been marvelously effective shooting down things like HIMARS missiles, which we didn't expect. Absolutely not. And we didn't expect the, the uh, Iranian cheap and deadly yeah, drones right. either. That's right. We yeah. thought all innovation is ours. But clearly, Russia has moved from, let's fight this on the cheap, to we're now going to win it and dictate the terms under which we will live in the future in Eastern Europe. That's where we're headed. And that's when you begin to look at these axes, where could they go? Well, clearly the ideal way to handle Ukrainian defenses is to attack them from behind. I would be yes, very surprised yes, if yeah. that did not happen because you have enough forces on the Western side, on the Eastern side of Kharkov that could easily come across and turn South. You, you were saying that, that the Ukraine and Kharkov, uh, you know, <clears throat> facing Belgorod, yeah. is, has a very thin screen right now. Well, it did. Forces. It did. And they, they abandoned it. That's why they abandoned it. They had 2,000 men, and they just simply abandoned Kharkov, that entire corridor, all the way down to the river. But my, my point is they now have a large concentration facing that. That could conceivably be channeled over the river and back into Ukraine. But instead yeah. of going north, which is what people would think, oh, we're going to Kiev, no. It turns south, and it meets the other concentration coming up from the south. The, these two things, I think, will happen. The real question is what happens in Belarus. And that concentration, if it comes down, it could have the effect that Inchon did. Yeah. A lot of people don't remember that what was nice about Inchon was not simply we struck where the enemy was weak, but they were positioned in such a way that the North Korean forces had to retreat. They realized their position was hopeless and started rushing northward for fear that they would be encircled and destroyed. And I think it, it could make a lot of sense for the yeah. Russians to do something similar. The, and then everyone uh, runs, runs north on the east side of the river to get out of the trap. If you can have a, a breakthrough, say, from Belgorod or from south of Minsk, what would the forces in the south, in the Zaporizhian area, would they try and, and break through what are strong defenses or just well, hold the Ukrainians? Again, if they can attack simultaneously or near simultaneously from both sides, everything will crack. 
then it will fall apart quickly. I see. I, uh, listen, no one should uh, diminish in any way the fighting skills and power of the Ukrainians. Ukrainians were always good soldiers. They were good soldiers under Their the Tsars. Their casualties attest to that. <clears throat> yeah, and they were good soldiers in the Wehrmacht, yes. and they were good soldiers in the Soviet army. So I think, I think that's, that's nonsensical, but you can only expect so much from any human being. Right. These people have been exhausted. They've been bled white, and they don't have the experienced cadre they once had. You know, by October of 1943, right. the German armed forces, the Wehrmacht, had lost 55,000 officers. That's incomprehensible. That means that most of the talent, not all of it, but most of the talent, particularly at the lowest level, yeah. these are the people yeah. that ran all over Europe for That's years. That's right. They were gone, or they were wounded. And as a result, the German army's offensive striking power after, after the fall of 43 is dramatically reduced yes, and, quite frankly, inadequate. I think the Ukrainians are in a similar position right now. Uh, have the Russians uh, adapted in ways that will, in, the, in terms of their combat unit organization and in terms of the manner of how the offensive will unfold, sort of leave behind the uh, unwieldy kind of organizational structure um, of, of divisions and, and corps and armies <coughs> that, that most Americans think of in terms of a new Well, warfare. they really already have. When, when they went through a series of reforms, you ended up with a vast majority were in what I would call large uh, mobile brigade groups. Uh, these are usually five to 6,000, sometimes four to 5,000, sometimes 3,000. Depends on right. whether this is a tank-heavy operation or mostly motorized infantry or something, or mechanized infantry. They do have motorized rifle divisions. They are 8,000 men strong. They're the largest formations in the Russian army, but they have been used primarily as assembly areas. In other words, bring it in and then commit it to other formations to, to fight, as opposed to sending in a division-sized unit. All of these formations are commanded by generals. And what we did see, uh, even with the battalion tactical groups, which was a new innovative approach, which had, had some merit. Uh, I think our USI is saying the Russians have abandoned it. I'd be surprised if that were the case, but they're the only ones saying it. But they did have situations where they had one of these brigade group headquarters that was managing seven or eight of these battalion tactical, tactical groups simultaneously. Right. We're much more rigid in our thinking as we were in 1942, 43, yeah. and 44. So it's incomprehensible that we would do business that way. But the Russians, even towards the end of the war, would have as many as seven to 10 divisions under one army headquarters, which was a core equivalent. Unthinkable for that, us. That's right. But so, it gained enormous ground quickly. So you, know, you have generals commanding brigades then? Yes. In Russia. Yeah. That, that's, not, that's something that you don't have. In the well, the British Army does. The British, right. the British Army they, has brigade battle groups. But they don't usually have more than four combat battalions in a brigade battle group. But, you know, the Russians are demonstrating, oh, we can do better. That's an old British. Tradition. They're more yeah. flexible and agile in this yeah. sense. You also pointed out why this happened, because the, 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 the distracting wars in the former Yugoslavia and the Middle East in which NATO found itself paradoxically and strangely engaged in the middle of Central Asia, didn't continue to keep the bonds of dependency strong. In fact, it began to weaken them. And NATO, I think, it, it's very cohesion. Well, you had one other, one other event that tended to reinforce American dominance and control, and that, of course, was the 1991 Gulf War. Yes, yes, yes. <clears throat> People looked at that and said, clearly, there's no one in the world that has access to the technology and the capabilities of the United States. And so I remember, a, I think it was Time or Newsweek that had a headline that ran, showed American soldiers in the desert and said, where will they go next? And of course, within no time, you have Madeleine Albright, yes. who meets with General Powell and says, you keep talking about this great army, well, why can't we use it? And of course, Powell's view was, well, that's a last resort. American military power is not the first resort, but the last resort. And we, we were transformed at that point into kind of a 9-11 force, that wherever the polit political leadership decided to send us, we would go and somehow or another muddle through and make things right. Well, that hasn't 
worked out very well. No, I mean, we became, a, 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 you know, the light infantry ethos, but it was really, in, in, in terms of its employment and deployment, a kind of SWAT team military. Yes. And during that period, the U.S. dominance was so great that European militaries began to slough off the things that made them credible as militaries. Yes. I mean, the French stopped conscription, for yes. example. Uh, Germany's tank park <clears throat> is down to 200 tanks. The, the, the Netherlands gave up all of its tanks. So you have a kind of devolution into vestigial NATO militaries that aren't even like the old uh, legions of the Roman Soki, you know, mm -hmm, the Roman mm -hmm. allies. <clears throat> they're not <clears throat> equivalent in any way. They're, they're sort of like accessories. Yes, no, that's right. And the, the bad news is that having transformed themselves into effectively vassal states, yes. they are no longer in a position where they once were. If you go back to someone like Harold Macmillan, uh, the British Prime Minister, he was in Key West talking oh, to JFK a terrible moment. about the Cuban Missile Crisis. And then later on, JFK talked to him about the potential for Vietnam. And Macmillan said, out of the question, we, we won't participate in that. This changes, and right. Britain becomes a true vassal state, as opposed to, admittedly, once a great power, but still a force to be reckoned with to the point where we would actually listen to good advice. I think your term vassal state, which is used more and more increasingly around town, is an essential term to use, just as American empire is essential. Because when you have an empire, it's not about how much the imperial <clears throat> center administers its colonies. It doesn't have to be about colonies at all. Mm -hmm. It's about the relationship between the imperial center, the imperial court, and its client states. And when you're a vassal state, you are completely dependent upon and at the mercy of the imperial center. However, the empire does occasionally strike back. Yes. And we now have lots of little states in Europe that right. have joined this thing called NATO that are very interested in leveraging American power, military, political, mm -hmm. economic, for their narrow interests. Yeah. A wonderful example of that, of course, is Poland. And I would say Lithuania that sits next door. And Estonia <coughs> and Latvia. I mean, these are tiny countries. But these, they Not all, Poland, but the yeah, Baltics are. But they all have an agenda. And, and we have never sat down and, and clearly understood that those agendas are not necessarily our agendas. That we like these people and we want to do business with these people. And if they are attacked, we're happy to defend or help defend these people. And we know that they will fight. That's not up for discussion. The problem is we don't want to be dragged into any aspirational operations such as the Poles in Ukraine. On the other hand, these countries are all the more loyal to us, the more dependent they become, and their very dependency becomes an excuse for elevating the threat. And the uh, recreation of the mm -hmm. Russian threat is in many ways a a essential to preserving the absolute dominance, even supremacy, of the American empire called NATO. And it is still, however, paradoxical why we would be so intensely focused, not simply on using Russia uh, and the Russian threat as a way to keep NATO completely under our thumb, but actually going so far as to embrace the idea of Russian evil to the point where we will overextend ourselves, as we have, in this dangerous proxy war. And I'm, I'm wondering, <clears throat> what thoughts do you have on why the U.S. would go so far out on a limb, get so emotionally hysterical, especially among what I call the blue elites in the imperial court, uh, yeah. the current administration? Yeah. Well, remember, we're not talking about the American people. Right. They haven't been asked about any of this. Right. We don't consult them, and frankly, most of them don't care. So we, we have to do exactly what you've just done and be very specific about the well-financed minorities here in the, in the capital yes. who are pursuing these things. And by the way, your overextension and the same kinds of dangerous implications apply to Asia. Uh, and we're not looking carefully at those either. Now, I think it's, a, it's useful to, to consider the following. <clears throat> 
I think that uh, we don't understand the extent to which we are overextended, first of all. Right. There's a wonderful chapter written by uh, Corelli Barnett in The Collapse of British Power. It's called Covenants Without Swords. Yeah. And he explains how in the 20s and the 30s, the British began making all of these commitments around the world for which they had no forces to sustain. He said, so they end up going to war in 1939 completely unprepared for the global implications and the, and the commitments, and they never really come to terms with it. So what they do is impoverish themselves by relying exclusively on us to bankroll them. We not only bankroll them, we equip them, and so it's the first step on the road to, to vassal state status. Yeah. And that begins during World War II. I think it was by the end of 41 or the beginning of 42, the British are effectively bankrupt. They have nothing left. They're bankrupt, and they, they'd also managed to get themselves in uh, <clears throat> threat situations in three theaters uh, against Japan, uh, mm -hmm. Italy, and the Mediterranean, and then Germany. Mm -hmm. and, and before that, during the Winter War in Finland, the French and the British were ready to bomb the Soviet Union. Yeah, of course. Uh, which yeah. would have consolidated a Nazi-Soviet Eurasia along with Japan and China. Absolutely. And, and, and yet the, they were willing to do that for what? Well, this is also where you, you need a strategic reassessment in the sense that I hear people all the time, well, what about we want to be a, we want America to be.